सतो मदगमया तमसो मोतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमया ओ शांति 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 नमस्ते टू ऑल ऑफ यू वेलकम बैक टू द आत्मबोध क्लास I am happy to see so many of you, <laughs> and to resume our study of Atma Bodh. It's a Vedantic text with very profound meaning, and it's a text for meditation, not merely charcha, not merely discussion. Because the more we meditate on these things, the clearer the picture becomes in our minds what they are talking about. So Atma Bodh is one such text. which is repeatedly going to tell us some very profound truths and in very powerful language and they are direct pointers you can say to the ultimate reality of our being because atma bodh does this in so many of its verses we consider it the standard text for the study of vedant and please remember vedant is not just advait vedant that's the ultimate point uh, of vedantic understanding but there is also dvait vedant vishishta dvait vedant and of course advait vedant so many times you will see in various texts of vedant you have all these streams coming in uh in atma bodh especially you will find a lot of insistence a lot of uh, stress on advait vedant on understanding your real nature and uh, since we have we have been studying this this text for some time now you would have understood how the flow is repeatedly the assertion is towards finding our own true nature the atman which is one with brahman so this again will be highlighted in various ways in the verses which we are going to study today but please remember in the study of vedant we actually bring in even prayer we bring in any method of worship we bring in japa or what is called chanting the lord's name we bring in a whole lot of techniques in order to arrive at this knowledge we bring in all of this because it has essentially to, to do with the life of a spiritual aspirant what can i do in my present position of life just a little thinking may not be enough for me just now so i employ a whole lot of techniques many techniques in order to arrive at the truth that they are speaking about so all of this we will find in these texts let us go to verse number 28 today so we begin from here swa bodhe nanya bodhe cha bodha roopa bodh roopa tayatmanah न दीपस्य अन्य दीपेच्छा यथा स्वात्म प्रकाशने एस अ लाइटेड लैंप डज नॉट नीड अनदर लैंप टू मैनिफेस्ट इट्स लाइट सो द आत्मन बीइंग कॉन्शियसनेस इटसेल्फ डज नॉट नीड अनदर इंस्ट्रूमेंट ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस टू इल्यूमिन इटसेल्फ सी व्हाट अ प्रोफाउंड थॉट दिस इज व्हाट आर दे ट्राइंग टू टेल अस डू यू रिक्वायर अ टॉर्च टू सी द सन do we require a torch to see the sun or any other means to see the sun no the sun is so bright completely luminous self luminous that you see it by its own light in fact all the suns in the universe all the stars in the universe you are seeing them by their own light so a self luminous body will render its its presence luminous it will throw light on you and you see it through its own light so this is being this analogy is being applied to the atman the atman is consciousness itself so you do not require another consciousness to know the atman the atman unravels itself in a pure mind as it were you don't require the instrumentation of something to go to the atman that is that does not mean you dismiss all techniques which we are going to employ in our search for the truth it means the atman does not require anything to be known because it is self luminous in itself 
just like how you don't require a torch to illumine the sun you don't require anything to know the atman essentially but because our minds are clouded with very many things our whole effort is to clear our minds this is what sadhana is about the whole effort is to clean our minds purify our minds devote our minds totally to this truth and then the truth unravels itself the truth shines by itself this is the meaning of this verse so all of sadhana has to do with essentially it has to do with training the mind and for that you can use any method since we have various faculties in our minds we have the faculty of emotion we have the faculty of thought of will so there are different techniques meant to discipline all of these faculties through karma yoga you discipline the tendency towards action you through karma yoga you bring about a one pointed will so the the faculty of volition in us is taken care of through karma yoga through bhakti yoga you train your emotion you raise it to a particular level so that it becomes a help in our sadhana it becomes a it is in fact that alone is enough to take you forward towards god towards god realization so emotion will thought to gnan yoga you, you train your thinking process so that it takes us towards truth so that it does not tangle entangle us with a whole lot of things you, you you know very well how a confused mind works isn't it it is not able to find direction towards anything it it's just going in circles so gnan yoga trains us towards this and vedant also just just studying vedant we train our minds towards this so all of these faculties in us are trained in order to attain this illumination the knowledge of the atman without this training it is very difficult to know the atman so that's why you and we actually cannot say because it is self luminous it is ever there and does not require any effort on our part think and see and from our own standpoint only you can understand anything isn't it you can understand anything only through your own experience so think and see how can you know this atman which they are talking of without sadhana although it is ever there because consciousness is ever there mind is functioning and perceptions are taking place but to capture this atmagnyan some amount of training of the entire system is inevitable absolutely required and that is why the whole stress of spiritual life is on sadhana and that sadhana can be of various types i have seen very simple devotees of the lord you know it's so beautiful everything they do they convert it into a sadhana i have seen so many uh, young our even our young novices they go and tell everything to mother's picture and i have seen uh, people performing every action as an offering to the divine uh, i have seen a few devotees who continuously do japa that is uh, uh, taking chanting the lord's name and mentally imagining that every chant every name of the lord is an offering at his feet so mentally they are imagining that that mantra is one flower thrown at the feet of the lord so like this every devotee uh, invents his own technique you know what they feel intensely about becomes their technique their method towards god and this knowledge of the atman which is not different from brahma gnana the knowledge of the supreme truth of brahman can only be known through a training of this body mind complex once we are able to perceive that this body mind complex is nothing but an instrument through which i am functioning then we have stepped back into the truth of our being until then you must keep adopting some technique whatever is possible for us whatever feels real to us and then we come to this complete understanding it's a realization see the spiritual experience is actually not about discussion nor is it about too much of intellectual dwelling on that it is an opening up it's a realization of us something very profound and obvious and which is ever present 
It's a sudden penetration, an opening up into that. And then you just realize whatever you are going to realize at that point of time, you will, you will feel this was always so. I had not noticed this. So this idea which Shankaracharya is giving us here in this verse, it is telling us the same thing. See, the Atman is ever that point of consciousness which renders everything conscious. So there is no point in lighting a lamp in order to reveal the bright light of the sun. All that you have to do is turn your face towards the sun. Turn your whole being towards God. And then this will happen. The, the realization takes place by itself. And there is no actual technique to it, so to speak. As long as we are identified with body and mind, we will keep talking of techniques, methods, at some point of time, we suddenly understand that, well, there is no actual technique to it. It's a pathless path because the truth is ever shining. This is how the whole thing is. So in various ways, he's putting it in language like this. Let us take up that which is easiest to us. That is the way to proceed, which is most obvious, most natural to us. That is our dominant path. And taking that, we can proceed. Here, let me just mention this one thing that, uh, you know, prayer is a very forceful, uh, it's a tremendous path towards the divine. And the most natural path for a whole lot of people, prayer. Prayer means actually a dialogue with God, make, telling him what you feel, what you want, and the and one episode of real prayer, wholehearted prayer, will change your whole mind. So it is one of the best methods of sadhana, which sometimes many of us, you know, we our minds are <laughs> so active, overactive in a sense that we believe in thought constructs, we believe in philosophizing, understanding. But for very many people, I have seen. The simple act of prayer is life transforming and it sublimates their emotions and quickly takes them towards the divine. So you can actually apply prayer even to Atma Vidya, to Atma Jnana. In fact, bhakti towards the realization of the Atman is possible, perfectly possible and Shankaracharya recommends it. He in, he in fact defines bhakti like that. Swaswarupa Sandhanam Bhakti Iti Abhidhyati. Trying to know the real I, your real Swarup, that is Bhakti. So all of these are paths and doing something intensely is the most important thing. In a spiritual aspirant's life, doing is everything. Sadhana is everything. So let us go to the next verse, verse 29. Nishidhya Nikhilo Padhi Nikhilo Padhi Neti Neti Ti Vakyataha Vidyad Aikyam Maha Vakyai Jivatma Paramatmanoho. By negating all the Upadhis through the help of the scriptural statement, it is not this, it is not this, realize the oneness of the individual soul and the supreme soul by means of the great Vedic aphorisms. See, this is the point. By removing all upadhis from the mind, through the process of neti and neti, neti neti, that's the method used. Neti means na iti, not this. Brahman is not this. It is not the senses. It is not the sense objects. It is not the mind. It's not the ego. It's not the intellect. Everything that we refer to as I and me, me and mine, it is not, none of that. So then what is it? It, it can be known only through an empty mind which has been emptied by the process of neti neti. And this is the common recommendation in all traditions which follow the path of knowledge. Even Buddhism will speak of empty mind, vipassana of course you know it. Any tradition which has a solid uh, knowledge system which is following the path of knowledge will recommend this uh, state of emptying mind, which I have discussed in many of these talks. 
upper both jaws. So when you systematically empty the mind, yogically when you empty it, you are left over with being just barely conscious. Be no, it's not barely conscious. Bare consciousness. Bare awareness. You are left over with that. Awareness without thoughts. This state is to be aimed at and captured in meditation. If it is captured, it will lead you to the effect of neti neti. That is why yoga leads directly to Vedanta. A perfectly conscious state without thoughts. Because please see this, all of your identity is based on your thoughts. If thoughts stop, your sense of identity will drop. You are just there, not as somebody or something. You are just there. This state is to be captured. And then we will understand what he means by, see he says, in this state of mind, one can know, one can realize the oneness of the individual soul and the supreme soul by means of the great Vedic aphorisms. The Mahavakyas of Vedanta. You know, there are four cryptic, very important statements in four different Upanishads, which are called the Mahavakyas. And these Mahavakyas, they are just the chanting or dwelling upon them is enough for a right aspirant to reach the knowledge of Brahman. They are so powerful. They are four in number. I'll just repeat them here. Tattva Masi from the Chandogya Upanishad is a Mahavakya. That thou art. Tattva Masi. Ayamatma Brahma from the Mandukya Upanishad is a Mahavakya. Ayam Atma Brahma. This Atman verily is Brahman. This is a Mahavakya. This is the, one of the great statements of the Vedanta. Pragnanam Brahma is from the Aitariya Upanishad. It is a Mahavakya. It means consciousness is Brahman. And the fourth Mahavakya is Aham Brahmasmi from the Brihadaranya Upanishad. It means I am Brahma. Now see all of these four Mahavakyas, great statements are giving you equations between the Atman and the Brahman and Brahman. They are giving you the connection between the two. If in a very clear state of mind, which is bereft of thoughts, you have a very clear conception. Conception is not the right word, but you we have nothing else to use. You have a very clear sense of the Atman, the true I, then Naturally, you will see its connection with Brahman, the Supreme Reality. Like for example, Aham Brahmasmi. When you say this Mahavakya, in a very pure meditative state of mind, the Aham sense, the I sense in you is just glowing. I am. Not I am this or that. I just am. This amness, being. Immediately you, you know is Brahman. Pure being is Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman, the real I, not the, the I identified with the body and mind. the real I. Pure awareness is indeed consciousness. So like this, in the meditative state of mind, where thought, normal thought has been removed and you can, it's not just stalled, it has been purified and emptied in a sense. Mind has been, has been emptied of content. In that kind of a mind, awareness fills up. If it is done yogically, all these processes, it, you will find pure awareness. That verily is Brahman. So just the chanting of this Mahavakya in that state will lead you to the truth of Brahman. In fact, for a very ripe aspirant, this is what the Guru would do in, in those times, in the Upanishadic age. For a very ripe uh, spiritual aspirant who had maybe undergone a lot of discipline and purified himself 
or who, who was born with such sanskars, just the giving of the Mahavakya was sufficient to lead them to the knowledge of Brahman. That is why these are called the Mahavakyas, the great statements which directly lead to truth. So all this is to be known through practice, through sadhana. And then we will understand the efficacy of all this, the significance of this. Sri Ramakrishna, in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, you will find very beautiful examples of Vedant. He would say, you see, through the process of Neti Neti, you deny everything, this whole universe in fact. And then when you realize the truth of the Atman, you come back and see that everything is really He. Everything is that same truth, a manifestation of the same, the same thing shining there in a particular form and name. He used to say, there are three classes of devotees. The lower class says, God is up there in the heavens. And then the mediocre devotee says, He is in my heart as the indwelling controller. But the really superior devotee says, He alone has become all this. God has become all this that we see around us. So this is how Sri Ramakrishna is giving us an insight into how the realized person sees. The man of realization, what does he see? He sees that same Brahman manifesting in everything. So then there, is, there are no two things, you see, a world and God. There is nothing to run away from. You are worshipping the same being in so many ways, through so many forms, under so many names. So the very perspective of life changes. You remember Sri Ramakrishna's analogy of the Bilva fruit, the Bilva fruit, or we call Bale fruit here. I don't know if it is available there, but uh, this is a very interesting analogy. Let me read a bit of it because it's so powerful in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. See, every word is so potent. He says, Sri Ramakrishna says, God alone is the master and again, he is the servant. This attitude indicates perfect knowledge. At first, one discriminates not this, not this and feels that God alone is real and all else is illusory. Afterwards, the same person finds that it is God himself who has become all this, the universe, Maya and the living beings. First negation and then affirmation. This is the view held by the Puranas. A Bilva fruit, for instance, includes flesh, seeds and shell. You get the flesh by discarding the shell and seeds. But if you want to know the weight of the fruit, you cannot find it if you discard the shell and seeds. Just so, one should attain Satchidananda by negating the universe and its living beings. But after the attainment of Satchidananda, one finds that Satchidananda itself has become the universe and the living beings. It is of one substance that the flesh and the shell and seeds are made, just like butter and buttermilk. See, this is a very profound analogy actually. He's telling us, if you want to get to the flesh, the actual substance of the fruit, you have to negate the shell and the seeds. But if you want to know the weight of the fruit, <laughs> Very interesting language. If you want to know the weight of the fruit, the whole thing, then you can't negate them. It includes, the fruit includes the shell, what you call the exo cup, and then the miso cup and the endo cup. It includes everything. So it all depends on what point of sadhana we are. What exactly do we want in spiritual life? I have seen uh, very noble people, very good people who are not asking existential questions. Just they have very good sanskars, 
they have not come to a philosophical understanding of these truths which we are discussing but in their own intuitive way they have come to an understanding of god god consciousness and uh, without the process of inquiry they are able to manifest the highest virtues of life just the goodness has become their nature goodness and nobility purity this has become their nature so you see this analytical process which we follow it should lead its culmination lies in this in an intuition of the ultimate reality of pure being you are negating in order to ultimately affirm everything and you are going to get the whole weight of the bale fruit only by including everything you are going to know the real nature of this world to be non different from god not that god is one thing the world is its opposite is opposite and so you have to discard the world and go to god initially until our mind is not trained completely this can be this can be one standpoint that yes i keep a little distance from worldly ways because i have to develop my devotion to god but ultimately it is not about discarding anything because life is always as it is whether you discard something or you accept something that's only to you life goes on as it is isn't it life as a whole is nothing but a manifestation of god if you deny it you are denying that bit of god see your mind your own mind it is nothing but a manifestation of pure awareness your thought world your world of emotions the through that the world of objects and relationships which you have made they are all manifestations of that one awareness only in different ways you know in the yogic sciences we say thought and emotion is an expression of awareness it's an expression actually of vital energy which has a direct connect with awareness so these are not separate entities one thing manifesting in various forms so what will you deny and what will you accept if you see reality as it is there is nothing to deny because there is no duality <laughs> it is advaita alone there is there are no two but if you are if you cannot see the reality as it is because the mind has not yet come to that point then you make a few demarcations this is sacred this is secular this is godly this is worldly and then you choose what will help you in your sadhana your movement towards god and stick to your sadhana so that you come to this realization that there is nothing sacred and secular there is only the sacred there is nothing worldly and godly there is only god there is swami ji once uh, very beautifully he said you know um not that all is god god alone is all is a manifestation of that god not that all is and that is god all is not god god alone is and all what appears as all is a manifestation of that god so to grasp all these ideas and stay with them soak them up into your system sadhana is required it is good to do this kind of discussion and charcha but to digest this thing uh, one has to really adopt a means a method and for for that i always say that vedantic studies should go hand in hand with sadhana spiritual practice yoga and vedanta are deeply connected take up a method and dive into the state of knowledge so you see what beautiful analogies you find in uh, shri ramkrishna's gospel now let's move to the next verse verse number 30 avidyakam shariradi drishyam budbudavat kshara 
Etat vilakshanam vidyadaham brahmeti nirmalam. The body and so on created by avidya and of the nature of an object are perishable, like bubbles. Realize it through discrimination that you are the stainless Brahman, completely different from them. So the body and so on, created by avidya, we, we did uh, dwell upon adhyas. So this idea should be clear to us that how we have this tendency to identify with a body, a thought process, an intellect, and consider that to be I. We went through this procedure in the past, isn't it? We discussed about it. So the body is a perfect object to your perception, but you consider that to be I. Although it is an object, so obviously you are the subject, it's an object, but you consider it to be I. This happens because of adhyas, superimposition. You are superimposing falsity upon a substratum of reality. And this is inbuilt in our minds to consider ourselves to be what we are not, to identify ourselves with something which we are not, and to consider ourselves to be only that. So at some point, I think I told you the story of Bhruguvalli, uh, the story where a young sage, Bhrugu, is asking his father how exactly to get, the, get to the real I. And then the father leads him, uh, asks him to go for tapasya and tells him, find out the truth of Brahman through tapasya, through sadhana. And then Prabhu comes and says that, uh, I think I'm the body. And the father says, no, because the body is an object of your perception. How can you be the object of your perception? Think and see. It's logically impossible. Can you be the, an object of your own perception? No, an object is always an object. If it is an object of your perception, it means you are the subject apart from it. Even your thoughts are objects of your perception. Even your feelings. After some time, after the feeling has passed, you can perfectly see it and analyze it. At the point of the feeling, maybe you are very identified with it. But as it passes, you can see it for what it is. Which means everything happening in your mind is an object of your perception. So how can you be it? Your will is an object of your perception. Your intellect is an object of your perception. They are all objects for you. But how we have this tendency to go and identify with objects and think I am that and claim all our life that I am that. And we're doing it universally. That's why Adhyas is a universal phenomenon. And when it's common to everyone, you don't question it. If it's, if, if it's something uncommon, then we tend to question it. So this form of ignorance is so universal that we don't stand apart from the objects of our perception and question from that point, from that vantage point, who I truly am. So this is what he is telling us here. See, realize through discrimination that you are the stainless Brahman, completely different from them. Here, discrimination means Vedanta Vichar. Uh, that, that Vivek, separating the real from the unreal, the eternal from the non-eternal. So this separation, through this, you can know that you are separate from all of this body, mind, the thoughts in the mind, the emotions in your mind, your will, your will, your intellect, your motivations, your attitudes, your affections, you're separate from all of them. But then who am I? That you have to only know by stilling this. Enquiry, stillness. Enquiry, stillness. Still the entire system and the answer will come by itself. So this is the process 
normally recommended to all spiritual aspirants the combined process of meditation and inquiry in order to arrive at uh, this that he is speaking of in, even in the process of uh, even in the upanishad taitiri uh, upanishad when bhrugu proceeds step by step uh, he understands that he is not the body body is an object of perception then he is not his prana the vital energy in his system because that is also an object of perception he is not the mind monomai kosh that is also an object of perception he is not the intellect that is also an object of perception finally he comes to the anandmai kosh the bliss sheath causal sheath he understands he is not even that by the process of meditation he understood all this and finally he penetrated as it were through the bliss sheath and came to the knowledge of pure being that knowledge which is hidden in the cave of the heart and he understood the glory of the atman so see the same thing is being repeated again and again in so many of these verses it is important to repeat this in order to tell our minds what we truly are see your entire experience of life is based on identity if that identity changes a bit your experience of life will change so that is why vedant is again and again giving us these thoughts in different ways different forms so that it at least shakes our concept of identity our our understanding of ourselves so beyond this verse you will find very beautiful meditations also given you see the following meditation is suggested in order to strengthen the soul's oneness with brahman in order to understand our real nature look at the next 31st verse deha nyatvanna me janma jara kashala oh it's the print is gone here so i can't see it adayah shabdadi vishaye sango nirindriya taya nacha i am free from changes such as birth thinness senility and death for i am other than the body i am i am unattached to the objects of the senses such as sound and taste for i am without sense organs now see this is a meditation actually i am free from changes such as birth thinness senility and death anything happening to the body is not what is happening to me this is the understanding uh, because i am other than the body and i am unattached to the objects of the senses and unattached to the objects themselves <laughs> see we keep sense objects around us for the simple reason we want stimulation of the senses for most people life means stimulation of the senses but once we are once we see through this we see through this mode of survival just living in the senses through the process of discrimination through a clear understanding you can see that the senses never satisfy have you felt the truth of this they addict they don't satisfy they don't fulfill they have a tendency to stimulate to excite you but they don't fulfill because don't take anybody's word for it see it for yourself because this is the nature of the sense life and this is the nature of senses the the experiences got through the senses that is why constantly all these scriptures are asking you to keep a little away from them from the senses and sense organs for the simple reason otherwise you will get bound just with sense life an intellectual life is much better you stay with great thoughts that is so much better or a life of pure devotion so much more better you stay with very elevated emotions the devotion to god or you stay in the state of yoga all these are recommended but a mere sense life will keep you in a state of restlessness and constantly seeking something you don't know what because the senses don't satisfy 
that's why no matter what we have how much of things we have around us you you can experience this for yourself after some time they they just bore you they are a burden on you <laughs> you collected them with a great interest great love but they will continuously put you put you on what's called the hedonic treadmill hmm? the nature of pleasure is like that it leads you in it, it's, it's a treadmill kind of experience but uh, doesn't take you a treadmill doesn't take you anywhere isn't it it's an exercise sort of thing which finally bores you and frustrates you if you keep doing it the same way again and again so hedonism is like that pleasure theory just the senses give give us only this much you see these are all uh, you you can say these are all understanding born of a, of the meditative mind without meditation this understanding does not become firm and one doesn't mind chasing the senses unless one has tasted the beauty of a great thought world the the sheer liberation of great emotion and the state of yoga unless one has tasted this senses will be everything it is only through the power of meditation and sadhana that you get a taste for higher joys and then naturally you leave out the sense world isn't it sri ramakrishna used to say this in so many ways one who has uh, tasted uh, sugar candy syrup will not care for mere treacle <laughs> he would say so the thing is once you get a taste for these joys naturally you give the, that up otherwise the nature of the senses is to keep the jiva bound to the world hmm? see our eyes and ears and all they are geared to do that they are constantly going after things which are pleasant so pleasure can be a huge trap unless the mind has learned to uh, look inward and rise to a particular level if you see look at the objects you have collected around, around you in your home they all provide satisfaction to the senses and of course to the mind also we many of us have huge libraries so it satisfies your intellect mind and senses but how long <laughs> there there comes always in every you know i have found every human being has a monastic dimension in everybody's life this question pops up at some time or the other what more is there how do i get out of this a sense of liberation from the mere sense life comes in every every mind every human heart because this is what human experience is about it is about breaking boundaries it is about stepping beyond the mere sense life in fact if you actually see yourself you will see your your senses are made for this senses were given to us for survival you know at one point of time we had to survive in the forest so we developed a very keen sense of smell and sight and hearing senses are very good for as survival modes but they they are not meant to bring you higher happiness our problems occur only when we invest our entire happiness only in the sense world so this understanding that's why there are uh, levels of happiness in human life along every level there are different degrees of happiness and the way to gain greater happiness is to climb this ladder of happiness and not remain at the sense level which is only the first rung of this ladder and try to maximize happiness there if you try to maximize happiness at the sense level it will only lead to the hedonic treadmill and hence to frustration i have uh, just released a book called signs of happiness according to yog vedant which is again a compilation of lectures which i have given so you if uh, you can order the book i don't know it's it's available on amazon uh, but i think amazon india 
I don't know if it's still uh, available everywhere. But uh, if you order that book, you will find all these ideas put together. Happiness is, uh, there's a science to it and there's a technology to it. But our understanding of happiness can be sometimes very undeveloped or even perverted. And that's why people use all sorts of things to try to become, become calm and happy. They use drugs, they use all sorts of objects. And although they know, they, they can't find a way out. They just have to remain uh, in a state of happiness, uh, in a state of at least moderate calmness <laughs> in order to get through life. So drugs, alcohol, cinema, all these becomes means to just keep your mind entertained. So this kind of a, any kind of a cheap entertainment will only pull, you, pull your mind down even further. The way to get out of all this is to develop a, a clear sense of discrimination analysis and develop meditative habits, which means preliminary uh, sattvic life, meditative habits and clear vivek sense of analysis. And then it is possible to enter into this divine life Realize these truths for ourselves and attain higher and higher forms of happiness and fulfillment. This is no theory. This is the truth about every great life. This is the truth about every successful life. And by success, I don't mean just what you earn or what objects you have in your room, how many cars you have, how many homes you have. It's not about that. By success is meant the amount of fulfillment you have within your heart, even if it is bereft of everything else. The sense of complete joy in your being, in your heart. That is the actual success of human life, isn't it? Because no matter what we collect, after, after a certain point of time, it is not going to give you joy. So understanding all these uh, laws of happiness becomes important for us to pursue happiness in the proper way. Even Vedanta is constantly talking of joy and happiness, but the, the level of joy and happiness they are talking of is very high. So let us aim for it in our everyday life. See, these are all meditations. I am free from sorrow, attachment, malice and fear, for I am other than the mind. He is without breath and without mind, pure, higher than the high and imperishable. See, what a beautiful meditation this is. I am free from sorrow, attachment, malice and fear because I am other than the mind. A mind which is free of all this will, will naturally come to this understanding that even if all this happens, it is all part of mind and I am not the mind. <laughs> the mind itself comes to this understanding. You know, that is why the mind comes to this understanding that all of this fear, anger, hatred, see, we can make a heaven, I mean a hell out of heaven. Our mind is capable of this. You may be in, in really a heavenly place. Everything is beautiful around you, but the mind is a, can create a hell of a situation. It can be complaining, it can be bored, it can be depressed because it has not learned to lift itself to a particular level. The tendencies which we create through our sense exposures, these tendencies have not become noble. Then the mind will function in a mode which uh, creates a lot of frustration. So you see the entire thing, if you look at it closely, it depends on us. That is why in the human experience, 
the senses are given to elevate the mind not merely as modes of survival in the animal world senses are mere modes of survival better the senses better the survival but in a human society senses are meant to elevate the human mind and if we don't use them like that we will again be reducing ourselves to the animal level so this is the function of the senses and one realizes this as one proceeds in one sadhana that's why the most important thing in sadhana just now is not shutting off the senses it is purifying the senses so that our thought world is ordered regulated and elevated before we learn to transcend thought we must elevate thought to a certain extent to a certain height and then it becomes the means to transcendence that thought itself will liberate you so this is what is uh, recommended and he is without breath and without mind pure higher than the high and imperishable he is talking of brahman the supreme reality is of this nature higher than the highest imperishable beyond the mind so the constant refrain in all these verses is to find the knowledge of brahman which already is within you as the atman as the unit of pure awareness due to which your mind is functioning your body and senses are functioning and all that is required to know this is a little bit of discipline of this entire equipment in order to arrive at this many times i give this example of holy mother shri shabda devi when she was in uh, dakshineshwar in the nahabat you must have read in her life hmm? mother was working the whole day and she had definite times for spiritual practice and the rest of the time it was a life of service and devotion and mother used to say that at that time i felt like a picture of bliss was placed in my heart she was overflowing with joy and happiness outwardly very modest and always in the background and unknown to anybody see she never chased anything of this world <laughs> if you observe the life you will see everything had uh, everything was so deep about her and yet look at the level of uh, mother's mind in those days she says i was all constantly in bliss it was as if a picture of bliss were placed in my heart so these people have found the key to all this experience brahma gnan brahma vidya understanding uh, this knowledge of the atman it is entirely an experience what is the difference between an experience and a mere intellectual knowledge that's why you can't even call it knowledge because we are used to understanding knowledge as there is a there is a subject mode and there is an object mode and the subject knows the object there is a medium we are used to understanding knowledge in this way but this knowledge is far beyond dualities it is far beyond polarities so you can't even call it knowledge you can call it experience to a certain extent because it is something that happens happens and in your system but then it's not even in your system because you don't have a system it's your system is as much an object as any other object this knowledge is supreme liberation itself and it's not the usual mode of knowing that is why this knowledge comes only through the, through the meditative mind and the inquiry the path of inquiry these two are not different meditation makes inquiry real and absolute like a knife penetrating it through something without the power of meditation inquiry will be another feeble thought another curiosity so 
these two are to be combined inquiry and meditation and then it becomes something tremendous and it, to that if you add your emotion further and make it it becomes one huge prayer how will god not answer that prayer look at sri ramakrishna's life his initial spiritual disciplines were all based on prayer isn't it he prayed to the divine mother to give him the realization and it was given knock and the door will be opened seek and thou shall find so the essential thing is to dive within oneself once we generate this meditative mind consistency of the thought process will become normal to you distraction will become it, it, it's painful for you for a yogi pleasure is pain because it distracts so these are states of mind gradually step by step we develop in the process of sadhana and then that leads us to this realization the ability to say i am not my anger not my ego because they belong to my mind and not to me this is not an intellectual statement or an intellectual understanding this is he's he's talking it out of realization i am indeed not that so this is a remarkable state of being possible through sadhana i think time is up let us stop here as we take up verses further and your q and a session also from the next class we will take more examples from the lives of these holy ones because i think they best demonstrate all these great ideas and they will actually lead us to that this is the only way to understand these profound concepts so i think uh, let me stop today's class here with a prayer om sarve bhavantu sukhinaha sarve santu niramaya sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashe dukha bhaga bhave om shanti 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 he